Sura, the human form, is the greatest of Allah's proofs over creation. Sura al Insania or As Sura al Insania. Here, Akbar of Hujajilla Al Khamre. So, the human form is the greatest of Allah's proofs over creation. So these, all, these require meaning. And the meaning is important, not just me just reading the hadith and then everyone saying Allah Akbar. It's the meaning which is important here. What is this, what is this human form? And then it says, Wahiya. And it is, now it wants to define this human form which is the greatest of Allah's proofs over creation. Al-Kitab, it's the book. The book. Don't forget, Kutiba alaykum as Just have that in mind. Wahiya al-Kitab, it's the book. Al-Ladhi katabahu biyadi. The book which Allah has written with his hands. This is very important now. This is something which Allah has written. What is this book which Allah has written and which is the greatest of proofs and which is the human being? two definitions, and they're both the same, it's just two aspects of the same definition of what this book is. But just one note on Surah, because the tradition started as Surah to Insaniya, the Surah or form of a thing, of any X thing, is when that X has reached actuality, it's exited its potential state and it's reached its actual state. So the surah or form of an apple seed is the fine fresh apple. That's the surah of the apple seed, or of apples in general. But once it decays now, or even before that with the seed, growing plant and all that now. This Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith said, Allah created the insan ala surati. Which one is that? I was going to say that, but you're stealing my words now. Yes, I understand. Well done, yes. I'll come into that. Yes, well done, yes. Yes, where was I? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the surah or form of the apple seed is the apple. The surah or form of the human is when the human is an actual human being. And that's something divine. Because now we are potential human beings. I want this to dissolve gradually. I don't want to go too fast at all. You're getting the wrong message on it's the book, the book which Allah has written. Now, what is this book? It's a book which each one of us has inscripted within us. And that's the fitra. Or you can say it's the soul, the spirit, the essence of what we are. It has a kind of hardware. With that hardware, the fitra, all the groundwork, all the preliminaries are set for you to become from that potential human being an actual human being. Everything is there. Allah's written it. 
and was given that divine code to our name right in this book of existence, which is the greatest of Allah's proofs of the creation. Now, this potential has been described in different ways in our traditions. This is what the brother was alluding to. One tradition, I'll mention this tradition first, so it's relieved. إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ آدَمَ عَلَى سُورَتِهِ That Allah has created Adam, and Adam means us too, it's descendants of Adam, based on his image, Allah's image. The Christians have this tradition too, we have it too. I don't know how they interpret it, maybe they interpret it like us, but what this means, Allah has a number of attributes. You have the potential, because these attributes are inscripted in you also. You have the potential. Try to focus, not to be distracted. You have the potential too to acquire all those attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He's created you in His image. All the attributes that you can acquire them to. And that's the definition of aura, but proximity. But we don't want to go there yet. Other traditions. مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ شَيْئًا أَشْبَهُ بِهِ مِنْ آدَمٍ Allah hasn't created anything more like Himself than the creation of people, Adam. We are the most similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything, whatever is, is a manifestation of Allah's attributes. One or two of them, three of them, four of them, we though, as humans, have been encoded with a book, and we are the book. And this book has the potential that we can acquire all those attributes, not only one or two, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ آدَمَ وَأَوْلَادَهُ عَلَى سُورَةَ الرَّحْمَانِ Allah has created Adam and Adam's descendants on, based on the image, his image of Ar-Rahman, which is an incredible attribute because it means universally merciful. We have that potential. But then that same book, another aspect of it, and that's what really is important for us today in this world, is this book needs writing gear. It needs a writer. This book has to be filled in in order to reach that surat or insaniya. That writing occurs in this world. In the dunya, mazlatul akhira. The world is the hereafter's farm. But it's the world which is the hereafter, because everything is done here. The farm is you, that book of existence. The farmer is you, the agent who's doing the acting. The seeds are you, your actions. So this book of existence, which is Surah al Insaniya, needs writing. <coughs> and that's what we have to do. Kutiba alaykum siyam. Written upon you, the soul, the book of existence, written upon it, is fasting. Fasting is part of that code within us, that hardware. You act, you write in the book, you fast, and you will be more and more closer to become a true human. Okay, now this actualizing is difficult. There's no, there's no doubt about it, it's something very difficult to open that 
true human form, for it to manifest, for it to be actualized. We all just have to strive towards that. We may never get there, it's okay, as long as we're on the path of striving. We just have to abide by the protocols of that hardware. And those protocols is called religion. And CL, fasting, is just one aspect of that. But it's an important aspect that this verse was referring to. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because I said it's very difficult to actualize that book of existence. But Allah has given a commentary and he has manifested this book of existence for us. And the result of Allah's commentary, Allah's manifesting that book of existence of us, of every human being, when Allah gave a commentary of it, the result was two things. The Holy Quran and the Cosmos. Whatever's in the Quran, whatever's in the cosmos, are manifestations of Allah's attributes. All of them. And all those are in that book of existence which lies within each and every one of us. You want to know who you are? If someone asks you, what is man? What is human? Just say, look at the Quran cosmos and that's me now yes I may be an animal in action I may be weak but that's the potential man has being the Quran and being the cosmos that's why the cosmos can't exist without the Imam it has to always be an Imam on earth it doesn't make sense without an Imam So you discover that in a book, and you write in it properly, according to protocol, the result is the Quran. The result is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is a product of the perfect human soul. Now this needs explaining. Inshallah, either from tomorrow or the day after, during the nights of Adr, which is the night of revelation, and explain this process of revelation and why some people have just gone wrong a bit in understanding it. It's an important topic, I think it's worthy to share with you. But the perfect human being is that person who is a manifestation of all of Allah's attributes. That book of existence has been written to the letter, as it should have been. And therefore, from a state of potentiality, one reaches as an actual human being, the soul, the perfect human being. Another interpretation of Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, there's nothing like him, nothing like Allah. Here, some Orafo, yeah, they become sensitive to Orafo with these prepositions. The verse says, Laysa ka mithlihi shay. It should be translated like this. There's nothing like Allah's like. That's the definition, translation. What happens usually in the Qur'ans and the translators, they say there's nothing like him. They don't translate the kof. They don't translate the ka. Ka means like. Myth means like. They say ka mithli she. But they translate as nothing like him. So we ask them, what's the kof they're doing? The preposition kof. That means like too. They say that just emphasizes. It's an emphatic, super, superfluous preposition emphasizing the myth so there's nothing like him nothing but then some of say no there's no need to do that the 
you want to emphasize. Use it, it has a meaning. Suddenly the translation becomes different. There's nothing like Allah's like. Who is Allah's like? The perfect human being, the Maso. There's nothing like the Maso. And in our time, it was the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was revealed the Quran, a product of that great soul. And then suddenly, every year, the Quran is revealed. Who is it revealed upon? It has to be through the perfect human being. So, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Man Kutiba Alaykum Asiyah Don't that be done. Kama Kutiba Ala Ladina Min Qablikum As it was written, as fasting was written for those before you. Who were those before us? Let's go back. Christians, yes, they had fasting. They didn't have Hajj. Fasting was Kodiva under. Jews, they had it. They had fasting. Abraham's religion had fasting. Go back. Menkabrikom. To the center when? Go back. Noah, alayhi salam, no, had fasting. Go back. Adam, alayhi salam, had fasting. Go back. Yes. There is no. There's no limit here. Just keep on going back. Before Adam, there were also peoples. They were also written upon things. Things were written upon them. They also had a sharia. They also had prophets. See, now we're entering another different theme, which I, I want to open up in next week, but maybe towards the end of the month. The concept of physical reality and how there are many physical qiyamas separating one cycle from the other from the other. This has to be explained. What qiyama is? You've been taught things in qiyama, it's very good, and it's a good start, but ta'ala, go higher. See what the great scholars have said about it, and see how what they have said has practical implications in this world right now for you. But that's just physical Qiyama. The main essence of Qiyama with its practical implications is spiritual Qiyama. That's very important. And even that can be acquired in this world. So before Adam, there were other Adams. Before then there were others. Just keep on going back. There's no beginning. This just demonstrates the essential role fasting has to be a human being. Okay, so I'll stop with that close for now, but we'll come back to it. La anakum tatagum, so that you may acquire tagwa. And that's what I want to speak about, inshallah. We'll start tonight on tagwa. There are seven degrees, and we'll start one or two of them tonight, and we'll finish tomorrow. And then the day after that, I'll be introducing a tool which helps you to ascend these degrees of taqwa. And the tool is Muraqib. That requires, I think, two lectures. I have spoken about it in other places, but not in detail. As inshallah, I'll be done with you. So, we have to, you have to, I have to, we have to write our souls, our books of existence. It has to be written in. Fasting is just one example. We are our actions, and we write through our actions in that book of existence in order to actualize the essence of what we are. That Surah al Insaniyah, which Amir al Mu'minin referred to. Now, in chapter 17, verse 14, just to now, with that introduction, now some verses of the Quran 
may make more sense. You really have to focus on the whole, on the meanings. Until when do you want to just suffice with the external meanings? Many of you are very young here, and it's a very, very good sign. You know, you can really make the most of that book of existence of yours. Chapter 17, verse 14. Recite your book. Now, ah, what's that? Which book is that? Do you think you're going to be given a book for you just to read like this book? It's that book of existence. But what does it mean to recite it? The verse continues, Kafa benafsekal yalma aleika hasiba. Today, your soul suffices. As what? As your, as your reckoner, as your evaluator, as your manifester, as your judge, your book, recite it, it will suffice in relation to now evaluating yourself. Why? Because you were the book. You wrote in the book with your actions, and you are your actions, and those actions will be manifested in the hereafter. It's not a case of now all your actions being written, you know, you're seeing them and then it's put on a scale which one's heavier. The soul will manifest itself. The soul will be embodied. That will suffice. Kafor benafsik. The soul, the soul was the farm, the soul was the farmer, the soul was the seeds through the actions. That will suffice as the evaluator of you in the hereafter. Now read it. This really meaning that embodiment and manifestations of your actions. Or in chapter 54, 45, sorry, verse 29, Record everything that you did. You should record all your actions. 
Because where? The book. What did you write? What did you write in the book? You all your actions. It's all ingrained in the book. And now it's his death crap, get out back. Okay. So we have to really see what we're filling this book of existence with. But the aim, la anna contattavo, is say that we may acquire tavo. Okay. Now, what is tavo? Every time I give this speech, something happens with the video, or usually never gets completely online or anything. Um, this speech, half of it you can find online, though, but the other half you can't. And there were people trying to tape it and for some reason no one's ever succeeded. Inshallah, nothing goes wrong this time at Sarah. And that's why they've given me this. When I was in Alabama, a brother sends me this. I said, just record whatever you do and then send it to me. Because of the deficiencies though. He's in the hall now, I don't know if you know him. Mohammed Ozimo. Anyway. And Taqwa has seven stages. One after the other, it's one more difficult. The aim is important at the end. But if we don't acquire that aim, don't panic. As long as you're on the way though. Some of these are very difficult. It requires a lot of practice. But we'll go through them one by one and I'll give you some stories of the Quran in relation to this. Someone tell me if I'm coming overboard anyway. So I'll just continue speaking until someone tells me to stop. So the first degree of taqwa is, and taqwa means you know, being kind of immunity, being immune from something. Every time you hear the word taqwa, two dimensions of this being immune has to spring to mind. And with every stage here, these two dimensions have to be talked about. One is a refraining aspect, and the other is a controlling aspect. So with each degree of taqwa, you're refraining from something, and at the same time, you're controlling yourselves with something else. That's important to bear in mind as an introduction. In the first degree of taqwa, it's the sharia, as always. Never underplay with the sharia. It's something so important. You know, if you can, whoever your manager is, five or ten minutes a day, go to their sites, and usually they have English question and answer sections every day though, for five minutes, and go and read some of the factors which are, you know, related to you at least. Try and make a bond with this Sharia, it's important. I know many scholars today, they can't present the Sharia to the youth in an exciting way. And it can become very boring just listening to someone just keep on giving a set of rules. Half of it may not even apply to you. The other half, you, half of that you don't understand. What remains? Yes. It's important. Five minutes a day. On issues, and if you still don't understand the English, well, you know, email me. Alhamdulillah, the Bay Area yeah, is the, has produced many good scholars. Recently I met with Mirza Abbas during the camp. Very good scholar. Ask him, email him. He's from the Bay Area, he's one of you. He was brought up with you. And then the British stole him. <laughs> yeah, Sheikh Salim, um, Ali, Yusuf Ali, very good scholar. I think Brother Mehdi also, it was a brother, yes, but he's, he went also somewhere else. 
So, you know, you have good scholars, people have been produced here, alhamdulillah. Speak with them, they want to be you. And inshallah, there'll be more and more. But sharia is important. So here, we're refraining from the sins, the sharia sins, the chemical sins. And here, we're controlling ourselves with the wajibat, the obligatory action. This is taqwa of the first degree, and although it's the first degree, it's a pivotal degree without which you can't ascend, but it's the letter of the law. If you act by the Sharia wholeheartedly, and as it should be abided by, the inner dimensions of the Sharia, which is tariqa and haqiqa, will come into play will be facilitated, at least. But that's just the letter of the law, though. There are many people who do all the Rajivad, refrain from all the Muharramad, but they have very bad ethics. Very, very bad. And I'm sure everyone has come across such people. So it's very foolish to think the letter of the law will be sufficient. Even if they give you a heaven as a result of abiding by the letter of the law alone, it's going to be a recreational heaven, a materialistic recreation, the hoories, the food. It's like that. Someone said, a bomb. they said, here's your stable, for example. That's a still an animal, though. You'll be given heaven. But you're still an animal. You have to do much higher than this. That was the first. And since I've spoken about this year quite a bit on different occasions, I don't think it's necessary for me to open anything new here. But then, this has to be mastered though. The better you master this stage, the more easy it will be to ascend with the other stages. Now, the next stage becomes a bit more complicated. Now, don't panic, let me explain everything first. And then, here, in this second stage, you refrain from even the canonical halons. You refrain from that. Except that which is, has to be done out of necessity. Now, this is something incredible, but you may refrain from all the halals. It means those, this classification is a classification given by a Sufi, of, a Shia Sufi of over 700 years ago, Say Haydar al Muli. He has his tafsir, it's a very good book. If you can get taught it, it's something very really useful. He gives this classification. So here you're refraining from the halals, except if it has to be done out of necessity. Food has to be eaten. Okay? You can't die. So you're out of necessity, you eat it. But the delicate point here is this though. With all these actions, with all these halals, if you do it, whilst recalling Allah, that's okay. Do as much as you want. The halons which you're asked to refrain from here are the halons, like, you know, walking, drinking, studying, working, all these are halal. There are many things in Islam that's halal. But it doesn't mean, you know, one can do all those things, there'll be no Allah in the picture. Playing football, there's no Allah in the picture, usually. But if you bring Allah in when you play football, when you work, when you study, when you eat, when you drink, that you don't have to refrain from those halals. But actions where there's no Allah, and it's halal though, but there's no Allah in the picture, refrain from those, except if it's nasty, then out of necessity. When you eat, you usually don't recall Allah. But I mean, you have to, you're starving. And you didn't harm yourself, it's okay. You can eat because it's necessary, even if you don't recall Allah. It's that kind of 
halals that you have to refrain from. And that's why Islam has given a dua for everything. Just look at the texts. Coming out of the house, there's a dua. You're walking, there's a dua. There's some du'as which they divided the day, the day, not the night, into 12 parts. Each part has a du'a. Then you're studying, there's a du'a. You're working, there's a du'a. You're eating, there's a du'a. Why do you think Allah's done that? You don't have to memorize the Arabic. Well, I certainly can't either. He's just recalling Allah though. Look, even in the toilet there's a door. In the bedroom, in the kitchen. You name it, there's a door assigned. Why? Allah wants you to exercise this habit of recalling Allah of your actions. This has to be, you know, one has to make an effort. But if you don't, and you just do all these halals, walking, drinking, studying, even if you get a good degree, a good job, everything, but there's no halal, it's all futile, it's all void. It's all contaminating the soul when there's no halal in one's actions. Refrain from those halals, which are done halal-lessly, but even with those Allah less halos, if you have to, then you have to. I have to travel. I can't survive without traveling. I get the car. I have to eat. I'm dying. Eat. I have to do this. It's necessary. Do that. Out of necessity. Now, there's one story in the Holy Quran which highlights this degree of that one. And it's the story of Saul, Talud, and Goliath. Jalut. Very important story. Esoteric dimensions are very important to bear in mind. With the Quran, verses of the Quran have esoteric dimensions to them. As they say in Arabic, Butun. They won't have esoteric dimensions. The Matsum has to open those esoteric dimensions for us. And they have in many verses. The scholars, though, are free to explore. And with the help of the logic of traditions and other verses of the Quran, they can speculate on those esoteric dimensions. But they always have to say, maybe this is the case. And Imam Khomeini's Qonti Hadith, you just read the first chapter, you see many times he says, maybe this is the case. Maybe. So I'm not saying this is definitive. But this one is something which many scholars have spoken of. And when Saul set out with his troops, Saul was a man of God. He wasn't a prophet, but he received revelation. He was very divine. And in his army was Prophet Dawood. Saul set out with his troops, wanting to fight against Goliath. Verily, Allah is testing you by means of a stream, a river, a stream. Then the external story, as history has it, different reports of history, which is good to know. But remember, the Quran isn't a book of history. If you confine the Quran to stories of historical stories, you'll find better books out there in more detail. And that's a pity if you just confine this story to a story in history. That's why it's important that these stories all have a hidden agenda behind it. 
have, they all have esoteric meanings, dimensions. Those esoteric dimensions have one agenda again. They want you to eliminate all traces of the ego, but in different ways. Now look how this story opens this aspect of eliminating the ego. So really Allah is testing you with a stream. The story was that they encountered a stream. Saul said, don't drink from the water. Keep yourselves. We want to fight battle soon. Don't drink from it. It's a test. And if you want to drink, you only drink a handful of water. Only a handful. And then, the, from the 80,000 army, 300 and a bit of the soldiers obeyed, the rest, the thousands, drank from the street. They were very thirsty. And they kept on drinking. And they became even more thirsty on drinking the water. And that weakened them. And they couldn't fight in the battle. But the 313 did fight, and they won. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَا Verily Allah is testing you with a stream. We have a tradition that says إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا بَحْرٌ Verily the world is an ocean. فَقَدْ غَرِقَ فِيهَا جَيْرٌ كَثِيرٌ And drowning in it are waves and waves of people. But with this tradition, we can slowly get to see what the meaning is a territory of these verses are. I was testing you with this stream. What kind of test is this? Okay, the external side put aside now. Now let's go with the esoteric interpretations. Here, the stream is the donya. It's the world. The worldly life. And the water in the stream is the glitter of the worldly life, which waves and waves of people get drowned in. <coughs> and us testing you with the stream, it applies talking to us now, these verses. As you know, in the army of soul. Today, me, you. This world is a test. Also in chapter 3, verse 14, Zoyena le nas hopo shahawat. Made to see us, to men, to people, is the love of the worldly passions. People get drowned. They forget Allah. They become oblivious to Allah. It's a test. The verse continues. Faman shaliba. Minho Faleisa Whoever drinks from it is not one of us. It's not one of mine. Oh no, I give up. See, you want to be on the party of Allah, on the side of Allah's party? It becomes difficult. You can't get drowned in the world of life. The world is a test. In one verse of the Quran, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا We've assigned whatever is on earth as an adornment for it. لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ أَمَلَا To test them, to see which ones are the better, who, which ones act better. Whatever is on earth, the world, to test. Not to say that the world is bad, but your take on the world was bad. That worldly life doesn't exist externally, it's all inside. How you regarded the world. Otherwise, whatever exists on the world is something good. But your take on it was bad. And thus testing you with this stream. Whoever drinks from it is not one of mine. <coughs> Whoever gets drowned, and five minutes, yes. Although I can't stop in the middle of this story, so 
is keeping it high worth him. Yes. Whoever drinks from it is not one of me. To be on the party in the party of Allah, you can't get drowned in the world in life. Be in the world. Use all everything in the world, but don't get drowned in it. Now that has a specific meaning, we'll come to it in Shalomita when we speak about Morabebe. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتْحَمْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي But those who don't drink from it, they are one of mine. They are on the party of Allah. They are lovers of Allah. They are disciples of Allah. They didn't get drowned in the world, right? They were always with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَّا مَنْ اِغْتَرَفَ قُرْفَةً بِيَدِهِ And those who don't drink from it, except for a handful of water, that which is necessary. You see this second degree of taqwa, refraining from the animals, except that which is out, out of necessity has to be done. It's reflected here. Fashanibu minho illa qalilan